All righty. Uh, the second part of my presentation is a little background, a little theological background to how Catholics approach Scripture. Some of this you will pick up through osmosis in the course of the program, but there isn't a lesson, and that's, I guess, one thing I, I wish they had, a lesson, a kind of orientation to the Bible whatsoever. But you'll be picking this up from your teacher, uh, in, you know, listen to the lesson. But I want to have an opportunity for people who come with little or no background to get just some basic orientation. One last thing before I start. If you ordered books and I ran out of books, I have a truck trunk load of other things. I brought up, I only hooked up here what I thought my pack animal and I could man would need. So there's a few of you who came in that I wasn't expecting. So I think I can get you the Erdmans, I can get you the boat. Um, so, but you have to stick around afterwards and we'll go to my car and then I'll, I have, I have, I have rugs to sell you and other things. <laughs> other things out of the trunk of my car. All right, so we're looking at these two. This is the the stem the the stain the Belmar the sheet Bio de Bozos. You're not a bozo. This is a, a thing I put together for another setting, uh, and so I always be useful though. What it does is in, in outline it gives some basic orientation to what how Catholics approach the scriptures. This is a, a selection from certain paragraphs of the Catechism of the Catholic Church which will kind of supplement this. Given the limited amount of time I have, um, you know, I think maybe a, a, a better pedagogical method would be to let's look at the catechism and draw out the truths. I'm going to give you the truths, and then we'll go back later and point where they appear also in the catechism, given the time that we have. The first, and, and in a sense, most important thing to know when you approach the Bible is it's not a book. It's a anthology. It's a library. With a book, we, we have certain expectations. Uh, single, single author, nice transitions, uh, consistent characters. Maybe there are summaries now and again. We don't expect that the author will say one thing and then seem to contradict himself later. That you know, that's those are expectations that we bring when we see a sh bunch of sheets of paper sewn together. The Bible isn't a single author. Uh, in one sense, God is the author of it all. He has inspired it all. Truly, God is the author of the scriptures. But he worked through a variety of human authors. Over 1,200 years, we think, who lived in different places, in three different languages. And, and God used those people not as pieces of chalk, you know, the chalk has no mind. It only goes where the hand pushes it. Some people, I think, assume the Bible is that kind of literature. God took over, possessed someone, and so they kind of like wrote things without, without it going through their brain. Uh, that's not the Catholic approach to the scriptures. God is the author of everything in the scriptures, and there's also a human author. But in the end, what we get is not a typical kind of book, single author, consistent characters and all that, but this anthology, a library. And that explains its complexities. And I use the word contradiction. I'll never use that word in my regular teaching. I don't think the Bible contradicts itself. But there are tensions in the text. Something that we learned at one point gets adjusted a little later. Over here it said this way, over here it said that way. Because sometimes truth it can only be captured in, not in single statements, but in carefully balanced statements. When we get to Genesis, we're going to find the first chapter of Genesis has the story of creation that hangs on God's complete otherness. God is so beyond us. God says it, and it happens. God is transcendent. If you read past the fourth verse of the second chapter of Genesis, there'll be a second story of creation. And here, God is portrayed as not a monarch who commands that it happens, but an artist, a potter, who shapes out of clay his human creatures, and then his animal creatures, each one shaped 
out of clay. This bespeaks an image of God who is close at hand, who is involved, who, who is, is like an artist in the universe, or an artist in relationship to the universe. So which is it? Is God transcendent, utterly beyond us, or is God so terribly close and imminent to us? And the Bible says, yes. Neither one in itself says it. It's the two together. Now, for some people, that's a contradiction. No, 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 no. It's a greater truth told in balance. So think of the scriptures like, if, you're a, if you like music, a, a, a concert, a choral group, or an orchestra, the various voices, the various tones, the, the, the various timbres, the, there are you know, nice harmonic pieces, you know, where everything is in harmony. And sometimes there are pieces where there are things that are a little bit in tension, if you know what a seventh chord is, or a ninth chord, or a thirteenth chord. That's part of the beauty of it, too. So you will find things in tension. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. It's a library. God is the author of all of it. God used human beings, and he respected their freedom to not take over and possess their mind when he inspired them. How God does that exactly, we don't pretend to know, but we stand by that. So that's the first point. Second point is that it's a, it's a library, it's organized. You come into a library, there'll be carols of books. Uh, when I left La Crosse, the public library was organized according to the Dewey, no, the Library of Congress, no, do we just move? I don't know. Do we just move? The point is, all things are shelved. If history are the 900s, and you know, poetry or and, and politics is the 300s, you know, so the Bible has a kind of order to it, not imposed by God, because the individual writings in it floated separately until they were kind of gathered together. But they do have an internal order to them. You come into the biblical library, on the left-hand side is the, the room called Hebrew scriptures. Okay, the writings that we inherited from our Jewish ancestors. And the way the Christian Bible is organized is there are four shelves. There's the Torah or Pentateuch, there are histories, there are prophets, uh, there's wisdom writings. If you go on the other side of the library, it'll say New Testament, Christian writings. And there are similarly four shelves, Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, Letters, and Revelation. That order was done not by the authors, but by the collectors. And different people collected different books, which explains why Catholic Church has 73 works in its Bible. Most Protestants have a Bible of 66 works. Uh, Orthodox Christians, depending on what flavor of Orthodox Christian you are, uh, you may have 74, 75 works in your scriptures. The Hebrews, the Jews, have, well, we would count them as 39 uh, books in their inspired scriptures. So the collections differ a little bit from community to community, and they ordered them differently as well. But we'll get to that. Bible is library, not a single book, a library. That will explain the utter variety that you're going to find. Maybe you'll, you, initially you won't like its variety. You're going to think, oh my God, it's so complex. Eventually, I surely you will come to see it as it's one of its greatest gifts. So if the Bible is a library, it's also a time capsule. It's an old commercial. It didn't run for long because I guess it maybe it asked too much from the viewers. Uh, it, the, the, the camera opens on an architectural, I mean, a, uh, a dig, a historical dig, not architectural, but uh, uh, archaeological. archaeological, there's the word, archaeological dig. And you see all these people scurrying around this tell, this hill, and they're with brushes and brooms and sweeping looking for artifacts. As the screen comes on, you see a date. It's A.D. 2,145. Uh, everybody's, you know, 
they're doing their thing. You see the professors have their, you can tell they, they have beards and they wear <laughs> pith helmets. And, and all of a sudden, there's a lot of movement. A student says, professor, professor, come here. I think I found something. Um, one thing I should mention is everybody's sucking on cans of Pepsi. And uh, that's part, that's part it's really important. Uh, I should have said that earlier. So they all rush around and the, around the, the area where the student is whisk brooming dust off an artifact and presents to the professor what you recognize and I recognize as a Coke bottle, that classic <laughs> Coke shape. Huh? And uh, the teacher looks at it. The student says, Professor, what is it? The professor says, I have no idea. <laughs> and then the, the Pepsi logo goes on, end of commercial. Now what's being said there is that you know, someday that Coke is on its way out. Coke is like the dinosaurs. Coke is going to be something we, we dig up in archaeological digs. Pepsi is the drink of the future. Well, I kind of like that commercial. Uh, and it says something that I, I, I want to acknowledge. The Bible is a library, but it's an ancient library. It comes from long ago, a people far away. If, you, if we come to it as 21st century Americans, we drag a certain kind of point of view. And, and, and we got to be careful about that because there are things in that library that we won't recognize. Usually, I think maybe you'll hear it maybe this week, maybe next week, Beloit College always publishes uh, some facts about the new college freshman class. And one thing they try to do is calculate, what, what about these people who were born you know, 18 years ago? What, what, how do they look at the world? And one way they do it is by naming things that they've never seen before. They, you know, they've grown up, they only know, for a long time, for example, uh, I think 10 years ago, for, for young Catholics, the only pope they knew was John Paul II, because he had such extraordinarily long you know, reign, 22 years. So they'll say, think of all the things that your children and grandchildren don't know that you grew up with, you know, an eight-track tape. Those little spiral S's that you used to snap into records, little <laughs> records to play, you know, I mean, uh, a slide ruler. Uh, think of the things that we grew up with that are part of our experience that aren't part of theirs. And when you use those references, when I, as a preacher, use references to, you know, old movies, that doesn't work. They don't know what I'm talking about. So we must recognize that we're coming to our literature from far away. It will teach us. It's going to be work. We shouldn't, some people get very impatient with the Bible because it's not clear to them. Remember, these are ancient people speaking to us. It's, it is a time capsule. It's wisdom from the past. And that means we may have to puzzle over some of the names. People don't name their, their children like we do. Places, historical references, cultural references. So that's why good Bibles have footnotes. That's why we're reading things like the Erdman's Dictionary and the Boat, reading the Old Testament, to help give us that cultural, historical, theological background. So don't be impatient with that. That's the necessary tools you and I need in order to understand the time capsule, which is the scriptures. What makes the Bible unique to Catholics? Well, most Christians. You can boil it down to four terms, and it's on that sheet. The inspired, inerrant, canonical, revelation of God. A few words about each of those. Inspiration. We think about artists, architects, authors as being inspired when they convey some wonderful new idea to us. The ancients saw inspiration a little more focused. The root word in the word inspire is the word for breath. So to expire is to breathe out and not breathe in, to be dead. Because the ancients knew if you couldn't fog a mirror, there was no life in you. Life and breath came together. So they understood the person who had an idea as being breathed in. God had breathed into them. So where we might, in a cartoon, show inspiration with a light bulb, you know, bing, the ancients thought of it as the divine ones breathing. 
breathing something in. So when we call the Bible inspired, we don't mean it's just it's great art, yeah, like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or, or the pyramids. We, we mean it's God-breathed. And the quality of its God-breathedness is where we get off saying God is the author. He's the author of all of it. It's all inspired. Okay? So inspiration. That, that quality that it makes it proper for us to, under, to say that God is the author of it all. It's revelation of God. Now, the word revelation comes up in two ways in our study. Some people automatically think about the last book of the Bible. Uh, we will get to read that next year, and you're going to find it. It's, it's a wonderful book. It's not exactly what you maybe have thought it was or what people try to make you anxious about. But it's a wonderful word from God. This is the book of Revelation. But what I mean here is the whole Bible is Revelation. Hidden in the word Revelation is the word reveal. Those of you who don't know me have already, I'm sure, begun to make some apprehension about me or, or making certain understandings about me just because you see me walk around, how I talk, use my hands, things I've said. You're drawing from what you can see to get a grip on who this man is in front of you. But if you really want to know what's going, what makes me who I am, if you ask me, I will let you know. I'll give you my story. I will reveal myself to you. So just as in the word inspiration is hidden the word breath, in the revelation is the word reveal. God who cannot be known, God who is not a thing in the universe. God's not just the biggest thing in the universe. God is beyond. He's so high, so broad, so low. So it's for us to get, for us to try to get a, our little minds around God, it's, it's impossible. What we can say by reason about God is very limited. Philosophy struggles with that. What could we say about a God using human reason? But Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, well, I should say in right order, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all revealed religions because we believe God has stepped into history to say, let me tell you who I am. So the Bible is God introducing himself to us and along the way that we discover who we are. But it's revelation of God. It's God's letting me open myself to you. The Bible is inerrant. Now, that's a word you know. Well, but again, we Catholics use the word inerrant in regard to the Bible in a particular way. It simply means, of course, without error. And you can see the logic to it. If God is who we say God is, and God is the author of these words, well, God would have no business telling us fibs, lies, so everything in it we should accept as true. There are Christians and Jews who read the scriptures that way. That every statement of science, of history, and theology was specifically chosen by God word for word, and therefore we should simply accept it as it is. What that tends to overlook is that language is a pretty complex Thing. It's really, language is wonderful, but it's kind of hard to make sure that what I want to say gets to you to understand. How many times with your children or your spouse have you had to say, no, honey, that's not what I meant, okay? You thought you chose the right words. In your mind, it was very clear. You made a sentence, you stayed the sentence, stated it, but for some reason, they received it and it wasn't quite so clear. So cultures have a way of develop to help to make language less problematic. Cultures have created, every culture that's literary has created things called literary forms. Now that sounds very highfalutin, but you, you use them all the time. A literary form is a way of helping to make sure, to reduce the, 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 the problems in communication by grouping the word in a structure that will help you receive it. So today, you're leaving. You've got two people's piles of books there. 
you, I, you could say, I could hear Lederton saying, I went to the Bible class, my God, the books weighed a ton. <laughs> now, weighed a ton can be a literal statement. 2,000 pounds of something is a ton. But if, if you say something like that about those books, that's not a literary statement, a literal statement. That is an idiom, a figure of speech. We use these all the time. Heads up. What does heads up mean? Think about it. If I were playing ball, I'm throwing a football at you, and it's, it's going wrong, I say, oh, heads up, heads up. Now, if you take it literally and look up, you're going to get beamed by the ball. Heads up means be careful, awake, alert, something's coming your way. It, there's no logic to it, but languages work that way. We have forms like obituary, recipe card, uh, parking ticket, knock-knock joke. And given who, the context, you're going to use one of those resume. You know, love letter. I mean, think of all the different ways you have learned to shape communication. When you were in grade school, you learned the difference between a business form letter and a personal form. Maybe they don't do that anymore. Nobody writes anymore. So <laughs> hopefully you're old enough to know that. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, you don't send if you don't send a resume with a cover letter in, written in red flare. Say, dear Hans, I was hoping you'd give me like a job, huh? I mean, you, you, you use the right form so that you can communicate better. So I say knock knock. You say. I say Dwayne. You say? Dwayne. I say Dwayne in the bathroom. Help me, I'm drowning. <laughs> you have learned, you have learned the literary form of knock-knock joke. We don't use that form when someone dies. We don't say, knock-knock, guess who's not here? <laughs> we could, it would be thought rude, crude. It would miss, it would cause people not to understand us. And unless that's our purpose, it doesn't help us. Literary forms are how we convey our meaning to, to, to reduce the, the room for error. So when we approach any kind of writing, we gotta ask, what kind of writing is this? If I start out a book, once upon a time, in a land far away, you, I, have le I, the author, have led you to expect a fairy tale. When Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, he has given you a clue that what's going to follow is a parable. A story that doesn't literally have to be historically true, but is true in that it conveys a meaning, a spiritual meaning. So, back to the word inerrant. We some you know we get sloppy sometimes when we read the Bible and consider it inerrant without asking, well, maybe the author wasn't trying to be historical. Maybe the author wasn't trying to be um, uh, scientific. You know, remember, it's what it's it's not just what I think, it's what the author intended. Whenever you communicate, you gotta find out what did the author intend. That's why, again, in the classic uh, TV well, real life, too, counseling session, what does the counselor say after the person says something? What I hear you saying is, they're mirroring back what the person, what they heard the person say to make sure that they're both on the same page. What I hear you saying is. So, because just because you use the words doesn't mean I get it or I understand the tone of it. So, when you approach the biblical book, a question we all have to deal with, not always successfully, we can't always nail it down, is what did the author intend? When the person's right standing in front of me, I can say, honey, what did you mean by that? Or in a counseling session, they say, no, it's not what I meant, doctor. Okay, the person's right there. The biblical authors are gone. They're not here for us to question. But we still have to ask, what did you mean by that? What? And one of the clues we have is literary form. So this is a very tiny Bible, I grant you, but <laughs> what you see in, in this text, if you've got really good eyes, is the text is not printed from 
column to column, but it's, it's, there's a lot of white space. It's laid out like poetry, because it is poetry. And poetry deals with metaphors. You know, the pen is mightier than the sword. I don't have that anymore. It's over here. Never mind. <laughs> that's a metaphor. That's not a, that's not a literary, literal, historical fact. If you've got a gun and I've got a bick, I'm going to lose. <laughs> but the poetic metaphor is words can move people. Words can change things. So I've got to try to ask the biblical author, what were you trying? What kind of literary form are you using? The Catholic Church holds the Bible is inerrant, that God is the author of it, and God used human beings, but that human beings, because they were bound to a place and a time and a culture, chose literary forms to convey what they wanted to convey. And sometimes they spoke history, and sometimes they spoke law, and sometimes they wrote letters, and sometimes they told fables. And sometimes, sometimes they wrote, uh, they, they were a poem. So you've got to ask, what kind of writing is this? And since the, the communicator is not with us, you've got to look at the text. Sometimes the text will help us. Again, once upon a time, you know, kingdom, a land far away. That's really helpful. Sometimes biblical authors are just that helpful. Sometimes not so much. And that's why sometimes people reading the Bible will, they, they won't, it's hard to know sometimes because again the challenges of a literature from far away a time capsule but it's inerrant insofar as it teaches us what God wants us to know but the important caveat there is what did the author that God used a human author who chose a form to express that truth and we must struggle with trying to understand the form he used we shouldn't just assume we should just assume, we've got to ask, what did the author intend? That's the first question in, in, in adult, serious Bible study. What did the author intend? But it's not the last question. The next question is, what does it mean to me? At a public university, like UWL, there might be a class in New Testament literature, but they read it as, uh, indeed, uh, a time capsule from the past. It helps us understand ancient Middle East. But they don't read it, because of the nature of public education, they don't read it as God-inspired. They don't read it as revelation. They don't read it as something to live by. So after you struggle with what did the author intend, then you must also move to this question, and now, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to me? God is speaking through this. What does it mean to me? Both of those, you need both of those questions, not just one or the other. In, in some writing, in public universities, they work at the level of what did the author intend? What can we find out about ancient history? What, what can we find out about human striving? But we don't bring God into it. That's not how we're studying the Bible this year. Huh? But that's a necessary work. But we add to it the second piece. You will also maybe have an experience of people going to Bible studies and just sharing ignorance. Well, to me, it means this. To me, to me, it means that. No, the meaning comes from the author, the divine author who is a human author. Thus, we ask, what did the author intend? And then we can respond to it, and must, but we haven't done our work. The fourth term is canon. A canon, the root word there is yardstick. Actually, reed, because in Egypt, they would cut a reed and use it kind of as a, a yardstick. So a canon is an authentic statement of here's what is true. So when you're building a building, it's really important that all the workmen have the same kind of measure. If your yardstick's got 32 inches and yours has 37 inches and mine has 36, and we're all working on different parts of the building, when it, time, when it comes time to bring them together, they're not going to line up. So in one sense, the Bible is canonical in that the church has, has given us an authenticated list of things that we take as God's word. 73 books are the Catholic canon. 66 is the Protestant canon. So it's, it's that list of, of authenticated books that give us the truth. But the, word is, but the Bible is canonical in a second way. 
if I am puzzled by what I should do or what we ought do or by some other message I'm receiving, the Bible can act like a yardstick. That is, I hold my new idea up against the scriptures, the, the, the already stated word of God. And I can see where my thinking is not in accord with the word of God. God who spoke this way in the past is not suddenly going to change mind. We, we assume God's consistency. And so if my way of thinking compared to the Bible is twisted, then out of joint, then the Bible can be is my is my way of comparing. Again, like uh, you, you you maybe have seen bricklayers, stonemasons, they will be laying a couple of courses of brick or stone, and then they'll they'll take a level. Okay, so levels a piece of wood or metal with a little bubble with water in it, and they'll hold it up there. They want to make sure that the that the wall is level and not pitched one way or the other. If it's the, in fact the words that stonemasons use is is it true? True is it true? Is the wall true? So in that sense, this is our level. The Bible as canon is a level. We hold it up to our thoughts and ideas, our expressions and our dreams, and it in comparison will tell us if what we're intending to do, what we think we've heard, what we're inquiring about, whether it is of God or not, whether it's true. Canonical. So the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, canonical revelation of God. Totally human, totally divine. Everything else on that page, I think you can manage yourself. And really, a lot of what I want to say is there. Any questions about what I've said so far? Are your ears bleeding? <laughs> You have to go with Michael. He's a he's a much more thoughtfully choosing his words, relaxed teacher. I'm kind of like. <laughs> I want then in the time remaining. I want to look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church because I told you that. You say, well, that's fine, Father Mark. That's what you think. <laughs> where does the Church think? Well, I want to show you that where I got what I just shared with you is what the Church thinks. Catechisms are not trying to be imaginative or creative texts. They're conservative te texts. They pull together what's already been clarified and stated. In fact, if you look at the footnotes, you'll see a lot of them begin DV. DV, that's an abbreviation for the Latin Dei Verbum. That's the Latin title for one of the documents that came out of the Fathers of Vatican II. The, uh, the Constitution on Divine Revelation. Get it? Revelation. God revealing himself. Dei Verbum. So what you have really in front of you is primarily a collection of quotes from what the Vatican Church Fathers already said, sprinkled with some words from Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Augustine and St. Paul. So this is a conservative gathering of statements the Church has already made in the past about the Bible. Let's just really briefly read a few of them. And again, I, I did it kind of backwards. I should have started with the Bible, but given the time we had. Paragraph 101. If you've got a pencil or a highlighter, here are some things I'd like you to, to have leap off the page at you. In order to reveal himself to men, reveal, there's that word. Dei Verbum took as the model for the Bible God wanting to be known to us. He reveals himself to us. Like interpersonal relationship. I reveal myself to you. In order to reveal himself to men in the condescension of his goodness. The word condescension has got a negative connotation, but it really it doesn't have to. It means bending low. When a mother bends over the crib to pick up her child, she's descending. Okay? So it's not, don't be condescending to me. It, it's the idea of bending low. God has bent low to us. He speaks to them in human words. And then here comes a quote from Dei Verbo. Indeed, the words of God expressed in the words of men are in every way like human language. Now that's a very profound statement. The church is saying that when God speaks to us, he bothers to use human language. He didn't have to do that. 
The problem with human language, though, is it's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? What did you mean, honey? Okay? That, that's, that's, so in that statement is both that God has not chosen to blow us out of the water by coming to us in you know, full light, but he has bent low not to scare us, to come in a way that we can grasp. But not, but not without some struggle, because human language is always demanding struggle. So it is the Word of God, it is God's self-expression in human words. Therefore, all the techniques of human language will be called on. If you were an English major, that will be a great help to you read the Bible. Because the technique of reading literature is helpful in approaching the Bible. And the church says, no, that should be a surprise. Because God has chosen to speak His words in human language. Cross the page to 106. What you get here is like a first sentence that kind of summarizes the, the, the paragraph, and then comes the quote from Dei Verbum. God inspired the human authors of the sacred books. The statement. God inspired, there's that word inspired, the human authors of the sacred books. Here comes the quote from Dei Verbum. To compose the sacred books, God chose certain men who, all the while he employed them in this task, made full use of their own faculties and powers, so that, though he acted in them and by them, it was as true authors that they consigned to writing whatever he wanted written and no more. What the text is saying is what I said earlier. It's not like God picked up a person like a piece of chalk. The chalk has no mind. No. The human beings were true authors. That God found a way of communicating himself through human beings without taking away their freedom. Freedom is, for Catholics, it's, one of, it's God's second best gift to us. Free will. And that will explain the Bible's complexity. God didn't choose one person. A variety of people. And they were very different people. They were different in age, in century, I bet you they watched different TV programs, they went to different churches, they had different, they voted for different political parties. They don't all speak with out of one voice. It's not, it's not a chorus singing in unison. It's a choir singing at many different levels. Which explains why some parts of the Bible are so wonderful as literature. Genesis 39 to the end, the story of Joseph is one of the greatest masterpieces of literature of any language. Nobody would say the same thing about the book of Chronicles. <laughs> okay? In, in, in Genesis, at least in those chapters, God chose a human being who was a genius of storytelling. In Chronicles, he chose a bean counter. Okay? Apologies to anybody who's an accountant. Okay? The beauty there is God can work through anybody. He doesn't just choose the Shakespeare's. He can choose anybody, which explains why some parts of the Bible are boring. Not because God is boring, but God chose a person whose gifts were not in the area of literary writing. But it's all inspired. Chronicles is as inspired as Genesis. But God chose human beings who, as true authors, okay, used for the gift that they had. Net 107, here's inspiration. The inspired books teach the truth. Okay, there's, again, there's the statement, and then comes the paragraph from the Dei Verbum. Since, therefore, all that the inspired authors or sacred writers affirm should be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit, we must acknowledge that the books of Scripture firmly, faithfully, without error, teach that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided to the sacred scriptures. So, again, it's not saying that everything in the Bible is history or science, but that in the Bible, the statements that God made are true. They are true. Because God's the author of them. Turn the page. 109. In sacred scripture, God speaks to man in a human way. God speaks to man in a human way. 
To interpret scripture correctly, the reader must be attentive to what the human authors truly wanted to affirm and to what God wanted to reveal to us. So it's from that paragraph comes my earlier statement that the essential, the first essential question to ask a text is, what did the author intend? N not to do that is to drag our own opinions. People do it all of the time. We drag our own opinions into the text, read it into the text, versus let the text tell us. But it means you must struggle with what did the author intend. Next paragraph. In order to discover the sacred author's intention, the reader must take into account the conditions of their time and culture, the literary genre, that's a fancy word of saying form, in use at that time, and the modes of feeling, speaking, and narrating then current. For the fact is that truth is differently presented and expressed in the various types of historical writing in prophetical and poetical texts, and in other forms of literary expression. So we're being told to be careful and ask, what is the form that the human author chose to convey the divine truth? So we don't misunderstand it. Okay? That's a step that baby Bible readers often overlook. But we're going to spend a lot of time on that one. If you can give me two more minutes. Paragraphs 112. 113 and 114 give us three rules. These rules may not make a lot of sense right now, but know that our course is developed out of them and we'll come back to this through the course of the years. Be attentive to the content and unity of the whole scripture. You don't just read one verse and say, oh, there it is. There is God's answer to X. Okay? Because I'll warn you, if you think there's the answer to X, I bet Nicole and I can find something that will say something very different about X. Remember, God is utterly transcendent, and God is close like an artist. If you walked off and said, ah, God's, God's transcendent, I'd say, well, that's true, but it's not the whole truth. So the, the Catechism warns us that when we come to ask any question, what does the church, what does the Bible say about something? You've got to look at the whole of the Bible, not just one little verse. Again, this is a, also a favorite of baby Bible readers and some preachers. <laughs> Paragraph 113. Read the scripture within the living tradition of the church. People wonder, does the, doesn't the Catholic Church have an opinions about what things in the Bible mean? A few things, yes. But we have tremendous freedom. There's only a handful of times that the, the church has spoken and said, you know, because people are saying this about that text, we want to say, no, it also means this. I'll, I'll give you an example. Letter James, uh, at the end of it, um, the author talks about, if there's any sick among you, this is the fifth chapter, anyone who is sick among you, uh, send for the presbyters, let them pray over the sick person, anointing them with oil, and the sick person will get better, their sins will be forgiven. There'll be a footnote in your, if your Bible is published by the church, or with church approval, there'll be a footnote on that text. And it'll say, this is the text that is the fundament for the church's sacrament of anointing of the sick. At the Council of Trent, because, because the reformers said, there aren't seven sacraments, there's only two, only two in the Bible. The, the, the council said, no, James 5 is speaking about what we call the sacrament of anointing of the sick. That's a, there, there, there's like a half dozen times that you'll find that. Those are the only times in the Bible where the church has defined the meaning, the partial meaning of a text. There are others, and I can list them for you if you care. But generally speaking, beyond that, the church only steps in when we go overboard, when we go off the cliff. At the time of the Reformation, nobody ever questioned it before, but, but in, in the wake of the Reformation, people questioned it. So the, the, the church authorities, the Council of Trent, felt the need to define one element of the literal, literal meaning of that text. But, but, so there are some of those, but generally speaking, no. 
No. So, but it says, think, read the scriptures with the tradition. What did our ancestors learn? There are wrong turns. There are, there, people have taken verses out of context and said, here it is. And the church says, no, no, don't go there. Don't go there. So there is no book that says, here's what the Catholic Church thinks about every verse in the Bible. But there are wrong ways of thinking about the Bible. But the church has said, don't go there. So that's, that's the tradition with a capital T. Okay? Last, be attentive to the analogy of faith. I said earlier, I will never use the word, I use the word contradict only to say I'll never use the word contradiction. The Bible does not contradict itself. There are voices in tension, like a chorus or an orchestra, but it speaks the truth, and the truth is one. And, and so, if you struggle with a text and don't know what it means, and it seems to be taking you off in a strange, strange direction, always put it back into the context of the whole of the Bible and the whole of the faith. Okay? Because, because we understand this work as speaking from the mouth of God without, cause, without calling us to, uh, to disjunctions and contradictions. So... It's another way of saying, when you come to read a text in the Old Testament, and it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it's very Christian, ask yourself, how did Jesus understand this text? How do you suppose Jesus understood this? See, we, we learn to understand the Old Testament by thinking about Jesus is our window. Everything, all the truth of the Bible, in a sense, comes through him. If you find something that doesn't seem like Jesus, how would he have understood this? That's, that, is, that is reading the Bible by the analogy of what we know the fullness of our faith teaches us. Now there's more. There's much more there. I want just to highlight some of the things that were on the Bozo's sheet. I invite you to read those paragraphs. Um, if you've got a catechism, open it up and highlight them in there because they're going to be very, very important to our study. Uh, thank you for the extra time. My apologies for that. I am so thrilled that you are here. I'm so thrilled that Michael is teaching for us again. You're going to have a wonderful time. This is going to stretch you, and God will fill you. And we will up in Chippewa Falls. We'll be thinking about you. You think and pray for us. And those demons point as well. All right? If you've got questions, hang out. If you need books, hang out. Otherwise, Michael will see you on... The, not the, the 26, with your homework done, with bright, shiny faces. And what is the homework? You haven't really said. Oh, you know, I guess that was kind of, I told, it's the first three. The, what's up with this sheet here? Thank you for asking the question. I thought it was kind of clear, but I'm not clear. Session one, these three lessons, those questions. Okay. That reading, those questions. Thank God you asked. All right, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh. Well, how about turn this off and we'll go look at that. Good.